We were gone. Pastor Brandon and Pastor Dan uh, spoke and did a great job talking about keeping your eyes on Jesus. Um, I was helping my son, Nathan, uh, move into a house. And um, I told you a couple weeks ago, I didn't want to move, didn't want to help anybody move. But yes, I was, because that's what good dads do, right? We move. When our kids call us, we, we help out. So I painted for 10 hours one day, steam clean carpets for about five hours one day, and um, went to the dump one day. And I like going to the dump. It's therapeutic for me. Uh, I like throwing stuff away and giving stuff away. Uh, sometimes for me, taking something I don't need and giving it to somebody else or something that's not worth anything and taking it to the dump and tossing it um, just relaxes me. Uh, my goal is to be down in our house to just the furniture that we live uh, with and about four plastic totes, that's it. So um, I don't know why, just to me, that just seems streamlined and efficient. It's just a weird personality trait. So I had to go to the dump. My son was working back at work and they're like, well, dad, you're on vacation. What are you gonna do today? And uh, I said, well, I guess I'm gonna work. So I got to take a, a trailer to the dump eight foot wide by 16 foot long, but it was just full of stuff. I mean, jam packed full. And this is in Arkansas. And, um, and so I go to the dump and um, yeah, I pull up on the scale and I'm sitting there, you know, with my, my old Toyota 4Runner and pulling this trailer and waiting for them to get a weight. Um, roll down my window and I hear a lady say, sir, you're gonna need to come inside. Now, uh, I wasn't expecting that because I'd been to that dump like eight years ago or nine years ago and there was no coming inside. They were just thankful that you weren't, didn't take it outside of town and toss it on a dirt road somewhere. Um, and so I'm like, well, do they already know I'm just throwing away things I shouldn't be throwing away? It's all in plastic bags. How do, what, why do they want me to come inside? So I went inside and I'm standing there and she says, do you have a hard hat and a safety vest? And I said, no, I don't have either of those. And she said, then you can't come in the dump. So I stood there and looked at her. She goes, have you been to this dump before? And I said, yes, but it was before you required hard hats and safety vests. And she said to me, well, good, good news for you is we sell them. And um, so I'm there, I'm like, okay, so how much is this gonna cost me? I already had my credit card in my hand. And she said, well, the dump fee is 40 bucks. And she said, uh, $36 for the hard hat and the safety vest. So I buy a uh, hard hat that's about the quality you get at Burger King. You know, if they give you one with like a, um, this, somebody just took a, you know, wrapped it with a knuckle, it would pop, you know, right in half and a safety vest that um, looked like a child's Halloween costume. And so the humiliating part is they wouldn't let me get out of my car until I put it on. So I got this safety hat on, I got my vest on, you know, and I hop out of the car and I'm over there and I'm unloading the trailer and I'm already grouchy because um, I'm at the dump and, you know, it's freezing cold and they just had an ice storm the day before. So this guy who works at the dump walked over and leaned on his shovel and watched me unload my trailer. I'm like, dude, can you have a little help? And uh, uh, uh he was a watcher, he was a monitor, he wasn't a helper. And he looks at my license plate, which seems to happen all the time when I'm there. And he goes, Iowa. And I go, yep, that's what it says right there, Iowa. He goes, you live up near the prison? That's what he asked me. And um, I thought, Probably. Do, do we live near the prison? Is there, there's one close here, right? I don't, I don't know. So I'm like, a jail? I know where the jail is. Yeah, not, I hadn't been there. If you have, I'm not judging you. I've been by there, I'm just to be clear. But I know where the jail is. Um, I said, probably. So the guy looks at me and he goes, you know Pat? And at that point, I wish Pastor Dan was with me because nobody else would believe I actually had this conversation. I'm like, I need a witness. I have to have a witness to this conversation. And so I scratch my head and I look at him and say, I don't think I know Pat. And they go, oh, well, Pat's husband's got a mechanic shop up by the prison. I thought you might know Pat. Sorry, I don't know Pat. And um, he goes, well, it doesn't matter. Pat's dead anyway. And so I wanted to change the subject. And I'm, I'm just like, I've got to find some common ground. So what can I talk about? Well, you can talk about the weather, right? And so I'm like, man, we've been having some bad weather. Now there, they don't get bad weather. We had an ice storm the day before. And, um, and I said, it's pretty cold, wasn't it? And he went slicker than, and I won't tell you what he said, but you can fill in the blanks, right? Think, were you able to get to work yesterday? That's what I asked him, trying to connect, right? And he's like, nope, couldn't get out my driveway. So I said the most obvious thing you could ever think to say. I said, ice? He went, nope, fuel pump. That's what he said to me. And at that point I was done talking. I just was like, all right, man, you have a great day today. There's no way to connect. Sometimes you just feel like it's hard to connect. Like you get only part of the story, like it doesn't make any sense. Well, today is the day where I'm gonna wrap it all up. We're gonna try to make sense of all four weeks of this series. 
Um, we've been in Hebrews 12, one through three. And we've been talking about how we run the race with perseverance. So now you guys are probably all New Year's resolutioned up. You're in tip top spiritual shape. You've made decisions and taken steps to improve physically, right? Show of hands. No, if there, a few of you are ready to do that, the rest of you are like, get out of my business, preacher. I'm not coming back next week. Emotionally, relationally, and spiritually, you begun to run. Maybe some of you are tired. The author of Hebrews was writing to a group of Christians, Jewish people who had become Christians who were growing tired. Earlier in Hebrews, he said, what happened to the love that you had for Jesus? Why are you being complacent in your faith? And he wrote some instructions or challenges in Hebrews 12, one through three. He said, remember, well, let's read it together. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, remember that, and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Four things that are really important that are all centered or focused on one central theme. And the theme is found in a word. And the word that's the theme, the way that we run the race is perseverance. Perseverance, don't quit, don't get tired, don't sprint and stop and huff and puff and get up and sprint again. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sprinting, I mean, yeah, sure, you can't sprint forever, but spiritually, have you made resolutions and changes and you're reading your Bible and you're praying and you're on fire and you wanna do everything for God and then you get tired because you're, you're sprinting and so you sit you take a break, it's a me time. You huff and you puff and sometimes you don't get up again for a long time. Relationally, I'm gonna be the best husband or the best wife I can be, the best parent. And we sprint and we fall, we stop. The apostle Paul talked about running the race. The author of Hebrews says, settle in and run the race, the marathon. It's the word that's used for race set before you to where you can figure out habits and decisions and steps that will take you through this life to the end with purpose. And you can finish without regret. So the word here that we're gonna talk about is to run with perseverance. And this word is really important. It means patience. And the word perseverance, the word used for perseverance here is hupomone and that's Greek. Um, and there are two words really used for patience in the Greek. And I don't have any tattoos. I've thought about it from time to time, have a hard time making up my mind. I uh, don't know where to put it, really don't really know, you know what I would get that I want there forever. But if I ever decided this is what I would get, these two words, hupomone in Greek would be one. And um, the second one would be macrothumia, maybe across the back or maybe across the, I don't know, I've been thinking about it. I don't know, you know, only Joy would see that. It wouldn't really matter that much. Hupomone and macrothumia, two words that are used for one of the most important concepts in the way we are to live our lives then and now. The most important two words to make up a thought that we can wrap our minds around today. Now, macrothumia is the word that the Apostle Paul uses a lot. It's used 14 times in the New Testament. And of the 14 times that it's used, it talks about being patient with people. Anybody have anybody in your life you have to be patient with? <sighs> I thought we got over this with the whole hello, hello, good morning stuff, right? Some of you literally have no, no one in your life who you have to be patient with. Let's raise your hand if there's no one in your life that you have to be patient with. If, okay, so that means everybody else raises their hand when I say, is there somebody, let's do that together, somebody in your life to whom or with whom you have to show patience, please. Okay, so the apostle Paul and um, the 14 times that this word was used was talking about when people disappoint you, when they wrong you, when they hurt your feelings, when they persecute you, be patient with them. And it's an important word. Hupomone is the other word that's used for patience and that's what's used here. And this word is not just being patient with people as macrothemia states, it's being patient or enduring difficult circumstances. Circumstances 
of success that can insulate you and anesthetize you, making you feel that you don't need God, circumstances of desperation that might make you look to something besides God, macrothumia and hupomone. Hupomone is what the author of Hebrews is using because he knows that the circumstances, the attrition of life can wear you down. Are you tired? He understands. God understands. Maybe these words could best be understood by the opposites. The opposite of macrothumia would be an angry outburst, somebody lashing out in rage instead of being slow burning and patient with people. The opposite of hupomone would be someone becoming despondent or cowardly, depressed because life is just not what they wanted it to be. Foul, sullen disposition, negative, withdrawn. And the author of Hebrews says, listen, when you're gonna run this race, first of all, run with perseverance because of all those who've run before you and how well they've run. Remember the witnesses who've run before you. That was the first week we spent together. We talked about this. Those in the Old Testament, those in the New Testament, maybe your grandmother, your grandfather, maybe somebody in your life who's gone to be with Jesus, who you know has finished the race and finished well. We've watched them run with perseverance and it wasn't because they were better than you or smarter than you or more gifted than you, it's because they didn't quit. When they got knocked down, they got up. When they were disappointed or disillusioned, they regrouped, they continued, they endured. When we run, we run remembering those who've run before us. Number two, when we run, the author of Hebrews is telling us we have to get rid of the past that may hinder us, the past that may slow us down. The past can be good times and successes. It could be the good old days. You ever meet anybody that worships the good old days? It seems like the older we get, the more we look back and we just miss the good old days. We forget that the good old days weren't always as good old and you know, great as we thought they were. We just remember them better than they were. We can't go back, but we worship the past and try to recreate the past, which causes tension for today. The Jews who were reading this or hearing this letter would have had bad religious experiences and the legalism of their faith would have caused them to really be disillusioned with God. And a lot of them wanted to walk away because of that. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, put aside the things in your past that weigh you down, the unforgiveness perhaps of an event, the way you've trapped yourself in a time, the way that you look in the rear view more than you look through the windshield. And then he goes on and he says, and there's also sin that trips you up, thoughts, actions, and attitudes displeasing to the Lord. Get rid of them. Now, if you remember this week or that week that I talked about the sin that trips us up, I said thoughts, actions, attitudes, but it's almost like visualizing walking through um, a class full of toddlers back in the kids area. They're always underfoot. And if you're not careful, you kick them. And so you have to do a shuffle when you're around little kids or little puppies. You don't lift your feet. You just kind of shuffle because you don't want, because they'll trip you and you'll hurt them and the illustration here is that there's probably sin in our lives that are literally in our way, causing us to shuffle and not stride in this marathon of life. And it's tripping us up. So the author of Hebrews says, get rid of it. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. The final thing that Pastor Dan and Brandon talked to you about was fixing your eyes on Jesus. Jesus began our faith by coming to earth as a man living a perfect life and dying a death he didn't deserve, providing the way for us to be right with God and to be looking forward to heaven to come. Jesus showed us the example of living this life, this life of faith and the way he related to people and the Father. You know, the first thing Jesus did when he began his ministry, he joined a small group, a city group, because he knew that living in isolation was the easiest way to fail. And not only did he model it with his disciples, but he wanted his disciples to know that alone is the most dangerous way to exist. 
and you can be alone in a group. And so we at Cap City, we have our city groups where we cultivate communities where you cannot be alone, where you can run with like-minded people who will support you and connect with you to lift you up when you're weak and, and to celebrate with you when you're strong. And um, Kathy will be in the lobby to sign you up for city groups, which start next week on Sunday morning, both at 9 and 1030. And so if you are even thinking about this, now is a great time to sign up and to start. Jesus also showed us how to communicate with the Father as he looked at the Father and spent time in prayer, asking for direction, looking at what was next in his life, only doing what he saw the Father showing him to do. And then finally, he finished the race and is seated at God's right hand where he secures our salvation and our eternity. And so these four things all are dependent on and descriptive of perseverance, patience, enduring through difficult circumstances. We know we're doing this. If you can answer the following question or statement in the right way, am I running with patience or am I being buffeted by circumstance? Is my love for God defined by my love for others? Or is my love for God only as strong as what I see God doing for me? Another way to put that is, is my love for God based on what he's going to do for me? Which means that when God doesn't do for me what I think he ought to do for me, that I can get mad at him and I can stop and I can pout and I can waste time and I can hurt the people who are around me and I can withdraw from my spiritual community? Or as I run, am I running with patience where I'm not just asking and answering the question, what is God gonna do for me? But I begin to view my life through the context of what is God gonna do through me? When I was helping my son move, one of the conditions of the purchase of the home was that we would clean out whatever was left from the person who lived there before after they moved out. It was a man in his 90s who had died, his wife had died 15 years or so earlier and um, his kids came through and picked out what they wanted. We assumed there'd be some treasures left and um, it was a risk. So Nathan and I, hey, we were willing to take it. After all, I'm the one that had to go to the dump, right? And so we went in after this man had lived his life of some 90 something years and had finished. No idea if he was a believer or not. I don't know him, just somebody who, whose kids listed his house after he died. And with my two boys, we were looking through his stuff, the stuff that was left over. Kids came through, pick what they wanted. And I was in the garage with my youngest, Nathan, who's 25, and we were looking at a wall. This guy was a hot rod guy. He had a Ford Galaxy, which I guess, depending on your definition of hot rod, that may or may not qualify. But he was a Ford guy, which led me to believe he was probably a good Christian man. Um, he had a sign in his garage that said, on a quiet night, if you're really still, you can hear a Chevy rusting, which I thought, you know, was, was a pretty good sign. <clears throat> so Nathan and I are standing there in front of the wall in his garage. He's gone, his kids are gone, and only what no one wants is left. On this wall was a shelf that was full of trophies from car shows that he'd won, races that he'd entered pictures of awards and certificates, photos of the dogs that he'd had along his life, everything that was important to him. And Nathan looked at me and he said, dad, what do we do with it? He said, do we just throw it away? These aren't our memories. It wasn't our dad, but we felt it. So I got to have a moment with my son and I said, we do, we, we throw it away, but we do it respectfully. 
we aren't dishonoring the man who lived here, but that's the way life is. You run your race. And when we run with perseverance and we get to the end, and the end is not a short-term goal. The end is whenever we close our eyes at this the last moment and leave this biological life behind, and we open our eyes and see Jesus, when we get to the end, same thing's gonna happen to us that happened to that man. Your kids will pick through the, your stuff and take what they want. And the rest of the stuff goes to the dump. And if you don't believe me, read Ecclesiastes because that's what that book is, is about. And it's not morbid, it's reality. We're here for a moment like a vapor. We're gone. But what matters is what we leave behind in the lives of the people we are around and the character we develop as we store up treasures in the real life to come. And the only person who finishes well and leaves this life behind without regret is the person who's willing to live beyond the idea of what will God do for me, but who chooses to embrace this concept that we are here for God to do something through us. And that's how you know if you're running this race with endurance, with perseverance. I wanna pray for you. We're gonna sing a few songs together and we're gonna come back and celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion together. And this will have a lot to do with the third week of our series as we talked about the sin that trips us up in our life. And we're gonna talk about examining our heart and getting rid of these things so that we can start fresh at the end of January as we're beginning a new year together. Because I want this year to be your best year ever, spiritually, physically, and emotionally, and relationally. At the end of the year, I want us to be different people for God's glory, for his kingdom. And I want us to do it together. So I don't want to um, mislead you into thinking that running this race, this marathon of life with perseverance is a really complicated thing to do. It seems very complicated. And I'll confess to you that a lot of pastors and spiritual leaders like to make things seem very complicated because um, it makes us seem smart, right? If we can explain complicated and detailed things. Same thing with diet books, right? I mean, dieting is pretty simple. You eat less than you burn and you lose weight, but you write books and videos and everything making it complicated because people want to listen. And I want to tell you that the way we grow spiritually, the way we run this race with perseverance is really simple. It doesn't mean that it's easy. What it means is that we do very, very simple things on a consistent basis. And over time, we grow. It's not complicated, but just because it's not complicated, that doesn't mean that it's comfortable. Um, Joy and I had a little disagreement this last week, which um, uh, that's what you do when your kids are not in the house, right? You disagree sometimes with each other. It passes the time. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, what do you do? We don't disagree much, but when we do, she's usually right. I'll just say that right off the bat. I went shopping on my own, which is never a really good idea. And, uh, and I bought a shirt, this shirt, for example. Oh, well, not for example, it's this shirt. And, and so I tried it on and I said, Joy, what do you think? And um, she looked at me for a long time, which means you know, what she thinks is not good. And she's trying to figure out a, a nice way to say it. Um, and uh, she said, well, you've never worn turtlenecks before. And I said, no, I haven't. She said, in the 35 years I've known you, you've never worn a turtleneck. And I said, no, I haven't. She goes, you don't like turtlenecks. And I said, nope, I never have. And she says, well, why are you wearing a turtleneck now? And I said, what's the problem with my turtleneck? And she said, that looks like one you got from my closet. That's what she said to me. <laughs> not my closet, her closet. And it's not a thing about turtleneck. So I think it was a thing about this particular turtleneck. And she said, you just never do that. And so I had to make a decision and uh, made a decision that I was gonna wear the shirt that I bought. It was on clearance and that's my love language when I shop. And so I, in fact, decided to wear it. Now, this is the reason I decided to wear it because number one, it's uncomfortable for me. And number two, it's something I've never done before. And I was literally thinking about it last night. I had two Sunday outfits picked out because I wasn't sure if I was going turtleneck or not. Yeah, you, anybody else put their clothes out on Saturday night? That's an easier way to get to church, by the way. 
If you put your clothes out on Saturday night, it's like a pre-commitment that you'll actually come on Sunday because you get up and there they are. Just a little tip from a friend to a friend. I had two outfits out. I got up this morning and I thought, nope, uncomfortable, never done it before. I'm gonna wear the turtleneck. Now, one of the reasons I did is because Joy didn't want me to. And that I think was more of it than anything else. But I think that there's a spiritual truth. And by the way, don't tell me whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. I don't wanna hear from you guys about that in fashion police. Um, doing something uncomfortable that you've never done before, sometimes is a really good reason to do something. And just because growing and running this spiritual race with perseverance isn't complicated, it doesn't mean that it's comfortable all the time. Doing something uncomfortable, like signing up for a city group, Sunday mornings, nine and 10.30. Maybe I've never done it before. It makes me uncomfortable. Maybe we give it a shot because there's built-in communities here with people that you can grow with. The church, lots of people, multiple services can become very small, but it's uncomfortable. Never done that before. Never done it at that time before. Give it a shot. Sometimes it's just good for us to say to ourselves, just because I've never done it and just because it's uncomfortable doesn't give me an excuse not to do it. And it may be uncomfortable for you and it may not be something you've done before, but that's the way that we put a stamp at the end of a series that we have been through in the beginning of this year, and we start the rest of this year, beginning with February and moving forward, making a difference in this world, living in community and running this race together. So I'm gonna pray, Brian's gonna sing, and I just want you to sit and reflect. And in just a few minutes, I'll come up and I'll give you further instruction. Father, thank you for the time that we have spent and the time we are going to spend. And I pray that my friends would be honest enough to you or with you to ask you to turn the light on in their heart. That you would reveal to them the things that are tripping them up in their lives that they need to get rid of. That you would give them the courage to make the decision. That you would give them the strength to follow through and the resolve, the steadfastness, the endurance to continue in freedom and living a different way. And Father, after we have asked you to examine our hearts, we move to a time of gratitude and thanksgiving, thanking you for providing Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins so that we can ask this forgiveness and you can give it to us so that we can live in a way where there are no barriers between you and me and me and others. So I pray that over these next few minutes as we reflect that you would speak to us because we need to hear from you in Jesus' name, amen.